Well, we are studying 1 Timothy, and we're in chapters 5 and 6. And as you know, there are a number of epistles in the New Testament, Romans and Hebrews being the pivotal ones, the pillars of it. But we have seven that were written to churches, and three of those were called the prison epistles. And then we have these peculiar ones called pastoral epistles, where Paul is writing to his protégés. They usually include Philemon in that group. We conclude Philemon when we study Colossians for some other reasons. So we're looking at First and, Tim First and Second Timothy and Titus in this group of pastoral epistles. I want to remind ourselves that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And is by the inspiration of God, ter that term in Greek means God breathed. We need to really understand that. Let's try to maintain an awe regarding God's Word because it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. For doctrine, that just simply means what is really true. That's what it really means. What's right? For reproof, that's what's not right. When we get off, reproof is to get us corrected, how to get it right. And, of course, how to stay right, instruction. And so that's uh, a pivotal verse in the whole group, 2 Timothy 3.16, easy to remember because of John 3.16. It's a very key verse. Okay, we last time talked about the apostasy that was coming. Now we're going to, in these two final chapters of this first epistle, we're going to uh, deal with the duties of the officers of the church. Now the church has many labels, and it's called a holy nation in 1 Peter 2, which emphasizes the believer's citizenship in heaven in effect. It's called a kingdom in Revelation 5, emphasizing the believer's common submission to the King of kings and Lord of lords. So in that sense, we're members of that kingdom. It's a priesthood, emphasizing the privilege that all believers have of direct access to God. Every one of us, all, all you men, are high priests of your family. So you have a priesthood that you need to be aware of and, be, and deal with seriousness. The church is called the vine, emphasizing the believer's common connection to the life of God to bear fruit. The purpose of the vine is to bear fruit. That's our purpose also. Church is also called a temple, emphasizing that it's built upon the solid foundation of the apostles' doctrine with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. And uh, it's a, um, also called a body, emphasizing the, the common life and dependence on our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also called a, an assembly. In fact, e ecclesia, the term, the Greek term means that. It emphasizes the common calling to be gathered into the eternal presence of God. It's called a flock, of course, a common need to be led and fed by a shepherd. It's called a family, emphasizing the intimacy, care and openness and love. These are all terms that are used. But the key thing is a verse that Jesus gave us in John 13. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have sound doctrine. Is that what it says? No. If you have love for one another. Exactly right. But a strange, that's a strange verse. Something very weird about that verse. You see it? A new commandment. I thought that's a command, that's a commandment that was given way back there. What do you mean a new commandment I've given you? What do you mean by a new commandment? See, the Greeks had two different words for new. Neos, meaning new in time. That's the latest model kind of thing. Or kenos, which means new in quality. Something that is new in the sense that it's radically different is the idea of kainos, and that's what's being used here. The commandment to love one another is not new in time, but is new in character. In Christ, it now takes on a whole new meaning. It's new in emphasis, it's new in example. 1 John 2, 7 and 8, and new in experience. So 1 John chapter 2, 7 through 11 will amplify that for those of you who want to dig into that. Now, Timothy has been ministering at Ephesus, tough turf. It's not an easy ministry, but I don't know of any ministries that are easy. The sinning members had abandoned truth and godliness. That's the spiritual family at Ephesus, we find. Some had shipwrecked their faith, we found, in the first chapter. Some women had abandoned their proper role and were trying to usurp the function of men. That was in the second chapter. Some men were aspiring to leadership without adequate qualifications. Have you ever run into that before? Chapter 3 and chapter 5 will deal with that. Some were teaching demonic false doctrines. You find that too if you, know where to watch, if you know how to watch for it. Impure lives were evident among some of the older widows and some of the younger, both. 
Ephesus was not an easy place to minister. But I'd like to ask the question, is any place really easy? I don't think so. The word discipline comes up. That's what a disciple really means. Someone given to discipline. In the Old Testament, it's all through the Old Testament. It leads to understanding. It leads to knowledge. It leads to wisdom. It leads to honor. It leads to happy life. D discipline. Obviously amply taught all through the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we could spend a lot of time badgering this concept of discipleship or di being, a dis being disciplined. The purpose of discipline is to save the offender. Sin needs to be dealt with because it disrupts the intimacy of a family. So discipline is crucial. So let's just jump in. 1 Timothy 5 it says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. See, apparently there was a temptation to ignore the older members. Love and serve all, regardless of ages, and not show partiality. That's what he, He's going to talk more about that before this chapter is over. The elder women as mothers, the younger as as sisters with all purity. Very early concern was expressed in the book of Acts. Old Testament had all kinds of legislation in this regard. All kinds of special care. I won't take the time here to detail all this. You can dig it out in, in your references. They'll be in the notes, of course. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them first to show piety at home, and then to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. In other words, don't be a burden on the church. This is really a reflection. Verse 3 there is a reflection of the commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother. The word nephews here, by the way, doesn't mean nephews. It means descendants. They didn't have the kind of vocabulary we use. There's no word like nephew or grandchildren. They use the word, a word that simply means descendants. Members of the family, in effect. Now she that is widow indeed and desolate, trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. So we're talking here in the first verse, if they're a widow indeed, that is without human support. They're in the fellowship without human support. That's what he's really trying to instruct him, that the widow that was a widow indeed without help, she was a burden then on the fellowship. That was the concept they operate under here. And uh, so, and uh, that uh, these things give charge that they may be blameless. That is not idle gossip and so forth. Now, if any provide not for his own, this is, now this verse is one to jot down and think about. It's a toughie. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Oh, wait a minute here. This is Paul talking. This isn't one of my flippant remarks that I often make and then regret later. No, this is Paul writing Timothy. If somebody isn't providing for his family, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Wow. That should make every one of us uncomfortable, us guys. That our obligation to our family is something we're aware of, but had we realized how important that is, worse than an infidel. That's pretty worse. That's a very sobering injunction indeed. Worse than an infidel. We need to be providers. We need to find a way. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, Taken in that number, that means to be enrolled or put, in, put on the list, used for the enrollment. It's a term that was used for mustering soldiers and so on. Well reported of for good works, if she have been brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. That's what he's talking about. Pretty impressive person. Dorcas and her widow friends are examples in Acts 9 and others. There's a definite connection between idleness and sin. Interesting project to link those up from the scripture. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers and also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Now I realize none of you know of any of those kinds, so we'll just move on. Huh? 
I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You know, there are people today that forego having children because of the awfulness of the times today. They should compare our times with Paul's days. We think our times are bad. It was worse then, in some respects. Guide the house, it says. How do you do that? Read Proverbs 31. It lays it out. Describes my wife, by the way, but that's okay. Each marriage partner has a special sphere of activity. And the word occasion is a military term that means a base of operations. <laughs> they give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. The word is an interesting term because it's a military term which means like a base of operations. Your adversary is looking to attack. For some are already turned aside after Satan, he advises here. Satan is always alert to invade and destroy a home. It's interesting to realize how the world at large is trying to attack God's institutions. The marriage, the home, God's order. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. In other words, he's saying if the widow has family to support, that they should step up to that so the church deals with those that don't have family, in other words. Widows indeed. There are widows who are without families, what he means by that phrase. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. That's interesting verse. That implies that it's appropriate to have incentive payments. Let elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. It's speaking of pay. That's interesting. Not, not are all necessarily equal. It's, it's as they merit. Elders were chosen, ordained, and set aside for work. We see that in Acts 14, 20, and elsewhere. The word honor there means honorarium. Double means generous pay. Interesting. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. He's quoting scripture here. In Deuteronomy 25 and 1 Corinthians 9 and elsewhere. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. One of the biggest shocks I've had as a student of management, as, as I say, spent 30 years in the corporate boardrooms, one of the biggest shocks I've seen in the body of Christ is how many churches are run on hearsay, where people are attacked behind their backs, there's never a hearing to determine the facts, and people find them, their, their, their character assassinated, their, their, their uh, positions of responsibility abrogated to others without any due process. And uh, I was almost going to do a briefing pack on this because I found a great case to use because most of the cases I'm aware of would, would re, re, uh, involve confidentiality. I'm not free to talk about some of the things I know about. But there was a very public situation down in Orange County and a law school, where the dean of the law school was accused by a student, and he was um, relieved of his job before an investigation was conducted. And the dean that, the, the super dean that did all that stupidly said so to the paper. He'd been removed, and he said, our investigation isn't finished yet. He didn't realize what he was saying, and the guy sued him for $10 million. And I thought, this is great, because I, I had the whole file of the whole story. Here's a law school. A Christian law school that it, it felt that Matthew 18 was for others, not for us, you know, because that we're, the, we're, the, we're not the laity, you know, really nonsense. And I was going to make it, except it turned out there was other unrelated background factors that I couldn't use it as a case study. But, but it's, uh, it's really tragic how many churches within the innards of them operate on hearsay rather than having an elder who's being accused be accused before two or three witnesses with some kind of due process. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. First of all, you want to be sure of the facts, but there also should be due process. You want to do everything openly. You don't want to receive an accusation unless there's a willingness to bring in two or three witnesses and have it heard and resolved, not lurking in the hallways. 
And I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. So, laying on of hands, by the way, is a term indicating a partnership in ministry. You lay on hands on someone to send them off in ministry. You're participating in whatever the result is, good or bad. So be cautious, he's saying. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine often infirmities. So how many people use this to enjoy a glass of wine? Thank you, Paul. You've done many, many people a big favor here. Abstinence is not required, but still there's no excuse for abuse or immoderation in anything, not just wine, anything. Let your moderation be known to all men. Okay? I'm very moderate with my moderation. I'm being facetious, okay. I want to tell you something about this subject that you might find useful. There are three principal feasts of the Jews that correspond to the three harvest seasons. The first is the Feast of Passover that occurs on the 14th of Nisan, which is in the spring. It's usually around our April, give or take, at the time of the barley harvest, Ruth 1. The second one is the Feast of Pentecost, which occurs seven weeks later at the wheat harvest. Okay? The third is the Feast of Tabernacles at the end of the year, September, October, on our calendar. That's during the fruit harvest. Get this in your mind. Passover, barley harvest. Pentecost, wheat harvest. Tabernacles, the fruit harvest. Grapes are fruit. They're harvested in the fall, right? Okay. What that means is there's no time that they can get grape juice except in the fall. There's no refrigeration. If you're going to pick grapes, you've got grape juice if you want it. But you better drink it pretty quick. Unless you've got an icebox, right? You follow me? How does grape juice naturally preserve itself? By fermentation. Right? So let's roll around to Passover. What did they serve in the Lord's Supper? Wine. That comes as a shock to a lot of people who are used to taking communion with grape juice. Now, I'm not knocking that because there are people that have alcoholic problems for to whom a little cup of wine might be hazardous. I understand that. So I'm not disparaging the practice, but I think it's useful to understand what we're doing. If you're going to be scriptural, you're going to drink wine, you know. Remember in the Old Testament, the manna that fell? From which they made manna pancakes and manna bread and <laughs> manna shevets. And, okay, okay, all right, all right, never mind. Okay. I'm being facetious. There's no grape juice available during the celebration of Passover. That's just a fact of nature, because they had no refrigeration. I mention that only because there are people that have these elaborate scholarly papers that try to make the wine grape juice. That ignore, that, uh, that all kinds of exegetical, it, it, they're bizarre because they have no grasp of all of basic agriculture in, in Israel. In, 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 onward. 1 Timothy 5, verse 24. Making good progress here. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. That's interesting. So we're to one last chapter. Last chapter of the, this epistle. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and this doctrine be not blasphemed. Now the economy in those days was slavery. And we need to understand, so when we hear servants and slaves, we, or masters, we tend to ignore that. That was just their economic structure. We have the same thing. We're slaves too. We're wage slaves. Let's set aside some of the other issues. Some of their slaves were probably better treated than some of our employees are treated. So don't pass judgments here without doing some homework. And servants here are slaves. It, it basically applies to employment. 50% of the Roman Empire was composed of slaves. That's why Constantine found it so shrewd to make Christianity a, uh, a legal involvement. It didn't make it a state religion. The second successor after did that. But he did, make it, he did legalize it. That allowed 
Because over half the slaves were Christians. That was a big chunk of the demographics. And many of these slaves were educated, cultured, but they weren't treated as persons, was where the abuse is involved. Now, the, our new freedom in Christ should not be used an ex, as an excuse to disobey, defy, or, de, or defy authority. In fact, it's the other way around, by the way. If you're an employee, just an, a rank, an hourly employee of a, of a employer, you owe that employer 60 minutes for every hour paid, right? If you are a manager of that enterprise, you owe the boss a fiduciary relationship. You, you have a commitment to protect the business, its assets, its intellectual property, all those kinds of things. If you're an hourly, you don't have those obligations. You just, you just owe him 60 minutes for every hour paid, unless you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, Ephesians 6 talks about the fact that you are to be a fiduciary, a koinonos of that employer. So an average employee doesn't, owes, what he owes the boss is a, limited, is a limited package. If you're a Christian, you owe the boss your wholehearted support. That's more than a non-believer requires, is required. So your, new, your freedom in Christ should not only be, should not be an excuse to disobey or defy authority. Quite the contrary, it encumbers you with a fiduciary relationship to your employer. And you need to research that and understand what that means. Let's go on. Verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If you've got a believing master, you don't, you don't take advantage of them. You get just that much better deal, right? So it's interesting that nowhere in the New Testament that I'm aware of, do they speak out against the institutional aspects of slavery, per se? That would have been disruptive and would have hindered the gospel. Now that's interesting. There's a very, very prominent minister. Had a fantastic ministry, coast to coast. That also was a tax protester. And we tried to tell him as friends, he's wasting his time. It's not that he's right or wrong. That's not the issue. You want to pick your battles. You, but he chose to not pay his taxes, and he's now 10 years in prison, and his ministry is in jeopardy because he didn't pay his taxes. If you study the, remember the incident where they came to Christ because there was a tax due? And he asked Peter, he says, who is it, is it due? Is it the residents or the strangers? It's the strangers. Well, they're not the residents. He says, nevertheless, go get a fish and get the coin and pay the tax anyway. Everybody knows the story of the coin and the fish. Read it carefully. They're paying a tax they didn't have to. Why? Keep the peace. Who's smart? Why get in the hassle? You know, get him a coin. Give him a coin that's over with. If my friend, who's presently in prison, had paid his taxes, his very unique outreach in the area of creation and, and, and uh, anti-evolution and all that sort of thing uh, was phenomenal. And yet he's now in prison. Important. One must be careful in picking your battles. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to hold some words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine of which is according to guidance, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, wherewith cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, and other things. There are issues that are important. There are also issues that are just divisive, unnecessarily unproductive. Constantly monitor what is being taught. And always monitor the fruit that it produces. Pride is often the badge of a false teacher. There are people on their radio. If I ask you, who would you feel has earned the title of Mr. Arrogance? And probably most of you can think of a name that speaks mountains just in and of itself. The lack of humility. The guy that has the answer for everybody. Be careful. Pride is often the badge of a false teacher. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. From such withdraw thyself. I have declined to enter into any debates 
with those types. Men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, that suppose that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Recognize the attacks of the enemy. What am I talking about? Remember the Jesus, the, 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 you hear the, the Jesus seminar heretics? Guys with fancy degrees that have absolutely no conception of who Christ Jesus is. Boy. Pulpits who fail to herald the atonement. All kinds of prominent pulpits in America, coast to coast. From which you will not hear about the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the cross, that he's our savior, from sin, the, the, the whole uh, ransom from sin and all that. Who is the God of this world? We shouldn't be surprised as we look out in the world and see this kind of behavior. What do these attacks include? Remember the last temptation of Christ in 1960? Hugh Schoenfield's book, The Passover Plot? Big deal in 1966. Peter Jennings' TV special? Never tells you that his wife's a Muslim. History Channel? Banned books of the Bible? Utter nonsense. Rubbish. Poorly researched. And of course, the Jesus, the Jesus Seminary, they vote on what Jesus said. They take votes to decide what Jesus said. In other words, subjective speculations instead of serious scholarship. Dan Brown is Da Vinci Code. Direct, de deliberate attack on the church. And National Geographic exploiting that with their publication of the Gospel of Judas. Something that was old news back in 81, discredited in the first century. Waltzed out by National Geographic in concert with the whole Da Vinci Code thing to, to, to lunch off the, 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 the buzz about all that stuff. Even when you take something like Mel Gibson's passion, which in many ways is a commendable effort, even he fails to identify who Jesus really is. He also creates the impression that the Crucifixion was a tragedy. No, it was an achievement planned before the foundation of the world. But godliness with contentment is great gain. That's in contrast to all the foregoing. And contentment here means the inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. That's a mouthful. Think about it. An inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. When everybody, anybody starts telling you about, well, under the circumstances, you stop and right there and say, what are you doing under them? <laughs> it is the wealthy people, not the poor, that go to the psychiatrists and who are more apt to commit suicide. Think about that. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. That's not quite correct. You can take it with you. Did you know that? They say you can't take it with you. Yes, you can. The secret is you send it on ahead, you see. You can't carry it out, you send it on ahead. How much did so-and-so leave? You hear someone passed away, some rich person passed away. How much did he leave? You know what the answer is? Nothing. Or he left everything, actually. How much did he leave? All of it. <laughs> Whatever it was. What did he leave? All of it. Everything. Didn't take anything with him. Interesting. Think about it. He could have sent it on ahead. We'll talk about that before this, this session is over. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith be content. That, that reminds you of the Quaker invitation. If ever thou dost need anything, come to see me and I will tell thee how to get along without it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I like that. I think that's pretty cool. Henry David Thoreau reminded us. Remember Walden's Pond? That a man is wealthy in proportion to the number of things he can afford to do without. Afford to do without. I had a strange incident occur. I was walking in a big computer conference. I was walking down the aisle, and a prominent uh, uh, financier in Orange County was, and his partner was coming up the other way. He said, there's Chuck Missler. There's the guy that saved my life. I looked at him. What's he talking about? No, I had no idea what he's talking about. And he reminded me of a conversation that I had forgotten about. We were having lunch. He and his partner had taken me to lunch when we were back in the swing in those days, trying to put some big proposal, some, some, something they were trying to get, get me involved in. And I stopped him. I said, let's stop on that right there. These two guys were partners. 
for years. They had no well-known. And they were at each other during this lunch. I said, wait a minute, what are you guys doing? And I turned to the one guy, the key guy. He said, uh, let me paint a picture for you. It's going to be probably less than a year away. It's a darkened room. It's an it's, it's a, it's a intensive care unit. There's an oscilloscope in a corner, beeping. And you're on it. You're heading for that. He looked at me startled. Then he leveled with me. Yeah, he, 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 all kinds of pressures were on him. He started to, you know, he, we stopped talking about the business thing. He just started telling, you know, he really was under intense pressure. I said, very simple. What you've got to do to make a list of all the things you're involved in and pick the one, the biggest one you've got and cancel it. He looked at me startled. Because, you know, they're always told, you know, prioritize and get rid of the small. I said, no, no, you got it backwards. You pick the biggest thing on your list. You don't need it. I know where you stand. You don't need it for your net worth. Get rid of it. Get out of that project. The thing that's the biggest pressure. Get out of the, take the biggest one, get rid of it. I'd forgotten that. That's what he did. He got out of some big project he was in. And uh, he attributed, attributed his life to that peculiar piece of advice. I don't know where I got it. I was just, you know, having it lunch, spouting off like I do. But, uh, but uh, you're wealthy in proportion to the number of things you can afford to do without. He didn't need that super project that he one of about five that he was in. Take the biggest one, get rid of it. Take the pressure off. It's not worth it. Doesn't take that's not rocket science. It's just sound advice from a close friend. Simplify your way to real contentment. One of the things we talk about in the Vortex strategy is to lower your, your uh, uh, cost of living. Well, how do you do that? You make a budget of your time. Figure out where you spend your time. Then figure out the capital investment that corresponds to that time allocation. Many of us have a boat or an RV or something that we use once or twice a year that's worth... It, that could simplify our lives to get that out of here. Rent it when you need it. Simplify. And do it by looking at where you spend your time and get rid of the baggage you don't really need. Simplify. Verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Indeed. Indeed. Now, that's not just Orange County, California, by the way. That goes everywhere. Okay? Now, another great tragedy, it's amazing how many people cross the finish line as winner and discover they really had entered the wrong race. People that spend 10, 20, 30 years climbing the corporate ladder to get on top, chairman of the board, and suddenly realize what it cost them. Maybe more than one marriage, whatever. I often think about that when I see a ballerina. Incredible, exquisite performances of the dance until you realize what it costs that person from the age of three on, whatever, a whole life, you know. You see virtuosos in various fields of, of endeavor. Very impressive and yet scary when you think of what it costs them. I even feel that way when I see some of the Hollywood stars. They produce some real blockbuster movie and it's really big news, made a lot of money. They spent not just a year, maybe two or three years preparing for that role, pouring themselves into it to deliver the performance that's worth five or ten million dollars, whatever. And it's over. And that project, it's a project, not a career, it's a project. It's over. And, they, and then you look at some of them that have done that for years. Why? What for? Spending all their life pretending to be somebody else? And maybe some of them so intensively pretending to be somebody else so often, appear to lose the capability of intimacy and commitment. Then he wonder that their marriages are like a revolving door. They're excelling in their chosen career field, but boy, what a cost. Count the cost. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. Big difference, understand the difference. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Boy, money is not an evil in itself. It is amoral. 
It's neither good nor bad. A bullet and a gun is neither good or bad. It's a bullet and a gun. It is the love, that is the obsession, the pursuit of money that is a root of all evil. Not the, by the way. Small point, but nevertheless. It may be all right to have what money can buy if you do not lose what money cannot buy. I like the way Jim Elliott puts it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Boy, that says a lot. No fool that gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Greed is where, where your treasure is, there's your, your heart is also. The difference between a hireling and a true shepherd. For years, Walter Martin used to threaten. He was going to write a book about Christian publishers. He knew where all the bodies were buried over his many, many years. He, had, he never did get around to writing the book, but he used to talk about the title very often. He was going to call the book The Hirelings of Christian, you know, Christian publishing. Wealth itself is not a sin. Abraham, Job, and Solomon were all extremely wealthy. Wealthy beyond our imagining. That's not a sin. Money can be a gift of God. Believers should be willing to part with their money when God requires, indeed. Because he, he, it's really His in the first place that we're simply stewards. Money love. Money love ignores true gain, focuses on the temporal rather than the eternal, obscures the simplicity of life. These are all from verse 6, 7, 8 of First, or, uh, yeah, first Timothy uh, 6. And results in sinful entrapment. You know, that's the tragedy of Orange County. That's the tragedy of Las Vegas, some of the other places. You get into a world in which you're trapped. Southern California, the property is so expensive, you're overcommitted, so you're on treadmills trying to make it all go. It's a trap. And that leads you to make a lot of bad decisions, harmful desires and, and eternal judgment. James warns about this in chapter 5. You can dig that out on your own. What are man's purposes for money? Well, to provide for security, that sounds good enough. Establish independence and create power and influence. That's the typical agenda of most of us when we were younger, probably. That's man's purposes for money. Let's contrast man's way with God's way about money. What's the focus? Man's way is power and position, of course. God's way is submission. That's his focus. He wants us to be submit to our king. What about emphasis? Man's emphasis is rights and freedoms, right? God's way is personal responsibility. Ooh, a little different pr perspective here. What about desire? Man's way is desire or gain for self. God's way is to meet the needs of others. Are you trying to gain assets to meet the needs of others? That's a whole different drive, isn't it? Are you more interested in rights and freedom, or are you willing to step up to your personal responsibility? What's your primary concern? If it's man, it's immediate fulfillment. Do it now. That's, what, that's why we're in a debt society, right? God's way is lasting achievement. That's his concern. What's our yearning? Praise of men. What's God's thing? Approval of God is the yearning we should be having. Are we seeking man's approval or God's approval? What's our aspiration? To be served. What's God's way? To serve others. You notice that there's just an antithetical perspective here? What's man's need? To push ahead. What's God's way? For patience. Perseverance. What's our striving? To lead men. What's God striving? To follow God. See, the perspective is a little different all the way through. What's our interest? Competition. What's God's way? Cooperation. A little different perspective of everything, not just dollars. Motivation? Ours is self-glorification. God's motivation is God's glory, of course, first, last, and always. What are God's purposes of money? A little different. Provision, direction, fellowship, and demonstration. Four main categories. We'll look at each one a little bit here. Provision, direction, fellowship, and demonstration. Provision, to provide basic needs. Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount. Establish daily dependence on Him. To deepen our love for the Lord. To develop a spirit of gratefulness. That's what 
God's purpose of money is. To establish our dependence on him, to deepen our love for him, to develop a spirit of great gratefulness, and to teach us to live within our means. Borrowing is a means of reaching around the limitations God has put upon us. And God's purpose of money is to help us enjoy our possessions. Interesting enough, Hebrews 13.5. Each one of these you can study. They'll be in the notes. Another purpose is to confirm. God uses money to confirm his direction of our lives. To build our faith and vision. To determine who is the Lord of our life. To protect us from harmful items. To teach us patience. God put me in the ministry by driving me through a bankruptcy. I had signed an eight billion, that's with a B, billion dollar joint venture with the Soviet Union. It all collapsed. I went through personal bankruptcy. I had a public company that I owned 51% of that I was trying to, I was stupid enough, aggressive enough to try to protect. God used all of that to get my attention, to redirect my life from the career that I thought I had been pursuing for 30 years, to focus on a hobby that I had for those same 30 years, and, and to do, put me where he wanted me, which I'm convinced he's called me to do what I'm doing. To concentrate on true riches. Third thing, to give to Christians. We want to get, the uh, uh, purpose of money is to, to unite Christians, to demonstrate the mark of a Christian, to initiate spontaneous thanksgiving, and to multiply the potential for giving. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the last thing is to demonstrate God's power. God will use money to cause Christians to trust Him. That's one reason He never gives us more than we need. He gives us what we need, but usually very little. Sometimes a, a check will arrive almost to the penny of exactly the, the need we suddenly have. You've seen there's, that happens so often. You have all the stories about that. that. That's God's way of causing us to get, take care of the situation, but in a way that we'll still trust Him. He also uses m money to mock the false gods of our age. He also uses it to purify our lives and motives and to bring non-Christians into salvation if we do it effectively. And, of course, all of this to glorify God. That gives, brings, of course, to the topic of tithing. God has a direct challenge in Malachi 3, verses 8 and 10. And I want you to notice this was instituted before the law. Well, tithing is just Old Testament stuff. No. It occurs in Genesis 14. The law wasn't given until, Genesis 20, until Exodus 20. Four reasons for tithing. It acknowledges the Creator's rights. The tenth of all is His. It is an antidote for greed and covetousness. It will change your life if you commit to it. It is a test of our faith. God challenges you. He dares you to put him to the test. Even Jesus quotes the scripture that it is not, you're not to test God. There's one exception. God makes one exception where you are to put him to the test in the tithes and offerings in Malachi 3.10. Very strange for God to put himself in a box, but he does. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so there will not be room enough to receive it. That's his challenge. And of course, it becomes the solution to every financial need. Is tithing. Make God your partner. And it's the Old Testament pattern. We can go through all of that if you like. New Testament is confirmed. Christ does not set aside tithes. It's implied in the even so of 1 Corinthians 9. Lay by him in store, 1 Corinthians 16. It alludes to all those other passages. It is more binding on us than the Old Testament saint. You know why? Because our privileges are greater. Whomsoever much is given of him, much shall be required. So the, the, it's even more binding us than the Old Testament. A tenth of everything is his. What does that mean? You need to be strict. You need to keep books. You need to be careful and be systematic. You want to do all three. You want to be strict, careful, systematic. You want to separate funds upon arrival and set those aside for his work. The tenth of it. And keep records because your giving only comes after you've returned his tenth. Well, I give a lot. Well, wait a minute. What is your tenth, and how much have you really offered? Your offering is only beyond that which is beyond the tenth. One of the things that you might be familiar with as a businessman or a portfolio manager is what I call the portfolio management concept. Norm, if you're a steward of somebody else's materials, you operate from period to period, quarter to quarter, year to year, whatever, and at the end of each period, you have a, a report, how well you did. And what you try to do during that period is to arrange your affairs to get the best possible report at the end of the period. You're trying to manage a portfolio. You want it to look as good as you can at the end of the period. You judge 
the period, your actions in the period by what was the results at the end, right? You can do the same thing with giving. Same thing with giving. What I call a portfolio manager of constant giving. A professional manager attempts to minimize their maximum regret. That's the savage principle of decision theory. Uh, the main idea is you make your decisions in light of the ultimate review at the end of the reporting period. What you want to do at the end of the period is be glad you did whatever you did, you do, whatever you did, right? You may not have lost as much as you might have. You might have lost less than all your competitors, but that's good. You follow me? It's always relative. How did you do uh, in the period? Well, if you're, if you're, if you're on a board of a of a uh, illumationary society, someone, you know, a charity that's of giving, you don't give money simply because there's a need. There's more need around than you can possibly deal with. That's not a meaningful criteria. What you want to do is you want to look for evidence that God is in the action, and then you join Him in what He is doing. Why? Because at the end of the period, what you want to do is look back and see that your monies went where God was moving and not just where they had the most plaintive need. Do you follow me? Because you, first of all, you, what you can do is may, may be a very um, uh, uh, modest difference in the first place. What you want to be able to do is invest with God. I'm convinced there's ministries around that God would like to shut down if the supporters would let them. You know? So you can take it with you. The way you take it with you is to ship it on ahead. If you were suddenly going to visit Algeria next month, well, where are you going to get Algerian dinar? You're not, going to, you're not going to wait until you get to the country. You're going to go to a bank and get some dinar from some international bank that deals with that to get whatever, a few hundred dollars, whatever, of dinar, Algerian dinar, because it's illegal to have outside the country, unless it's an international bank. If you go to Israel, well, Israel will take dollars, but and, and many, and most of us tra traveling Americans don't have problems because dollars have been the international currency up till now, and no longer they're, it's, they're losing that status. But the point is, if you're going to go to a country, you generally convert your whatevers to that country before you go. The well, same thing you do here. You can't take it with you. You got to just send it up ahead. Make your arrangements before you go. You send it. So anyway. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. But thou, see, he's contrasting him with these false teachers he's been talking about for a couple of chapters. He calls him a man of God. Now, Timothy was in good company. Who else is a man of God? Moses was called that in Deuteronomy 33, Samuel, 1 Samuel 9, Elijah, David. These are pretty, this is a pretty august company for Paul to put Timothy in, right? Joseph was called that, even though he's tempted by another man's wife. David, when Saul tried to kill him, we're all men of God. What a, that's a, that's a non-trivial title. The grace of the Spirit. Righteousness refers to personal integrity. And that's, the, that's probably a key thought, because when we speak of righteousness, that's sort of an abstract concept. When we speak of personal integrity, that's a little more piercing. Godliness refers to practical piety. Practical piety. See, the first thing has to do with character, the second with conduct. Righteousness is character. Godliness is conduct. Faith is faithfulness or dependability. Love, of course, is the word agape, which is a verb made into a noun, and sacrifices for others, to give and not to gain. Patience that we use there really means perseverance. When the, tough, when the going gets tough, the tough get going kind of thing. Meekness, power under control. That's pretty straightforward stuff. We have to cultivate these graces of the Spirit in our lives, or else we will be known only for what we oppose rather than for what we, for what we propose. Many people are so against everything, you have no idea what they're for. Not all unity is good, and not all division is bad. Jude writes his epistle to contend for the faith. The current spirit of the times is to you know, check your beliefs at the door. We're all going to get along, no matter what you believe. Really? Not me. Fight the good fight. There, here again, Paul uses these athletic terms. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. The word fight is agony, which is the word from which we get the word agony. Struggle. Straining to win. No pain, no gain. You know the story. Paul, at the end of his life, was able to say in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. Boy, wouldn't we like to be able to say that? 
but not between believers. Let's not forget who the enemy is. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quicketh all things before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. I give thee charge. That's a military, all through here, Paul is using military vocabulary, an order, a commandment. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the word here, the, the word appearing is epiphany. Christ knows his schedule. His, our task is simply to be faithful every day and abide in him. Which in, times past, which in his times he shall show who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. We don't have to fear life because God is the ruler of all. We don't have to fear death because he shares immortality with us. We've got both sides covered. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. See, one of the greatest dangers of wealth is that it can make us proud. And one then understands neither himself nor his wealth. We're not owners of anything. We're only stewards. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may hold on eternal life. Trust God, not wealth. The pursuit of wealth is often the evidence of insecurity. Boy, isn't that true? And you can't take it with you, as I point out, by saying it up ahead. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. Ah, and oppositions of science falsely so called. The word science here, it's, a, it's the technology we know by that name, but rather knowledge falsely so called, pseudo-scholarship. Now, denotatively speaking, Paul was probably talking about the Gnostic cults that claimed some special spiritual knowledge. The Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. gnosis. Science falsely so called. But boy, are we in a strange society. We are products of Western civilization which had a commitment for a thousand years to the pursuit of truth. And many of those great champions of what's called Western civilization would be shocked to discover that we live in a culture which makes truth outlawed in our schools. There's a concept in information sciences. There's a thing called disorder and order, noise, signal, cacophony or music, chaos, cosmos. The opposite, these are all, each one's the opposite extreme of the other. Randomness and design. These things on the left are randomness. Call that, the technical term is entropy. Randomness, chaos, disorder, no order. The stuff on the right is called information. Order, whether it's signal and noise, order versus disorder, design versus randomness, and so forth. And the trend if you, if, in life is for things that are ordered to drift to disorder. Always. We, that, that's, the, that's one of the laws of entropy. Now, randomness involved, when you study randomness in, in mathematics, there's two different kinds of processes, deterministic and stochastic. Deterministic processes, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Always. Stochastic processes are statistical. You know, what is the, what is the height of the average man? Well, that's a statistic, right? This has a mean, a variance, whatever. They suddenly plunged into... Uh, places where randomness is a variable. And in, that, in the real world, scientific world, you have occasion to need a random number. It turns out, when you understand what randomness is, they are very difficult to find, because all, the best you can do is get what they call a pseudo-random number. And it turns out that in 1955, the Rand Corporation, the granddaddy of all the big scientific think tanks, published a book called One Million Random Digits. And that book is, uh, may sound to a layman as a, a, that, that's how it's, a, it's a book with random numbers. You open that book and it literally is a series of numbers that are random. You say, what on earth, why does it take a big think tank with supercomputers to publish a book like, of random numbers? You've got to be kidding. No, 
You have to, this, I bring this up to show you, so you'll understand what randomness is. This is not as trivial as it sounds. They had supercomputers go through those numbers again and again and again and again to make sure that there was no symmetry, no predictability. Its, def it's defining characteristic is that total absence of design. Randomness and design are opposite as, as, as it is possible to be opposite. We live in a society in which our schools are prohibited from teaching the concept of intelligent design. Our teachers are inculcated and forced to teach the idea that the most elegant designs in the universe, designs that are so elegant we hardly even understand them, happen by accident, by randomness. That's why, when I teach this thing, I wear this set of beads. And uh, these are a series of black and white beads. Now I'm going to tell you a story. I spilled these beads on my floor by accident. But when I picked them up, I made sure I didn't want that to happen again. So I just decided to put them on a piece of thread. So I picked them up randomly and put them on a piece of thread. And I, after I did this, there's 247 of them, for those of you interested. I think I've got some information on that. Yeah, here we are. There they are. This is a little test. You're going to get epistemological IQ out of this. Okay. Now, in this sequence here, as I picked them up, picked them up off the floor by, by just by chance, put them on the string. But then I looked at it more closely. And there's two dots, dit dit. And then there's a dash dot. That's N, I N, right? Then there's a T, an H, and an E in Morse code. In the, there's a B, an E, a G, an I, another N. It spells, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I picked these up all by accident off the floor of my workshop. How many believe that? Why? How many of you think I'm putting you on? How many of you think I'm pulling your leg, right? Why do you think that? I'll tell you why you think that. Was this accidental? Or did I do this deliberately? I happened to be a radio ham, so it took me 15 minutes, all right? 347 beads here. An alphabet of two, black and white, right? So there's only two types, black and white. Any particular sequence is two raised to the 347th power. One chance in two to three. That turns out to be 2.8669 with 104 zeros after it. That's a very big number. This, as a binary number, represents a binary number of 347 bits. is a huge number. It's, it's a number that's... Or can you visualize a number with 104 zeros after it? It's a big number. How big is it? Borel's law in physics says that any number that has more than 50 zeros is defined as absurd. In other words, a probability, a probability of one chance in 10 with 50 zeros. See, in mathematics, there's an occasion where you need to have a cutoff. And so they decided the most absurd, that's defined as absurd. Any probability that's more rare than one chance in 10 to the 50th is defined in physics as absurd. Well, this isn't 50, it's 104. Okay? So for this to have happened by accident is not just unlikely, it is defined in physics as absurdly Impossible. Well, let's take a different case. Let's not take an alphabet of two. Let's take your hemoglobin molecule. That happens to be a chain of 574 elements long, and it's not an alphabet of two, it's an alphabet of 20. Okay? That's a little different formula, a little more complicated. If I take a binary string of 347 elements with only two, it's two to the 10, 104 power. The hemoglobin molecule, 574 elements with an alphabet of 20, Turns out to be 10 this, with 650 zeros after. Not 50, 650. Now you won't let me con you that this happened by accident. And yet you allow our teachers to tell our kids that the hemoglobin model happened by accident. It's so complex that we, don't, we only begin to understand all this. And by the way, in the hemoglobin, only one of those sequences is 
not fatal. The others are fatal. Hemoglobinopathy. Remember, Burrell's Law, 10 to the minus 50. There's only 10 to the 18th seconds in the history of the universe if you assume 60 billion years. There's only 10 to the 66th atoms in our entire galaxy. These are big numbers. We're not talking, you know, only 10 to the 8th particles in our galaxy. Anything greater than 10 to the minus 50, absurd. So the specificity of hemoglobin is far beyond any possibility of it having happened by chance. It's equivalent to winning the lottery. Most of you know the state lottery, right? How much? Winning it every day for 90 days in a row. That's pretty unlikely. Huh? And the genetic code that lies inside is so complex, we're just beginning to get a glimmer to it. It has punctuation. It has an alphabet. It's been designed. It's designed to be error correcting. And on and on it goes. See, the school will teach you that matter plus energy plus randomness produces life. That's not true. Matter plus energy plus information makes life. You can't explain where information came. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the DNA or the protein? You can't have DNA without protein. You can't have protein without the DNA. Same idea, same idea. Anybody that's been in a design team knows that you have to lot, if you've got different subgroups working on a design, they better be talking to each other. You can't have any randomness in the pro Randomness is the enemy of intelligent design. Thoughts and language are not physical. Where did thoughts and language come from? They didn't happen randomly. Anyway, Timothy, uh, Paul finally wraps it up with his first letter, Timothy. Which professing have erred concerning the faith? That's, you know, a science falsely so-called. Grace be with thee. Amen. And this first to Timothy was written from Laodicea. This is an append appendage on the King, King James Version manuscripts. The first to Timothy was written from Laodicea, which is the chiefest city of Phrygia, Pacatinia, and uh, so ends it. When he says, um, grace be with thee, the, the pronoun is the second person plural. People miss this. What it really says, grace and peace with all of you. Paul had the entire church in mind when he wrote this letter. It wasn't just a private little note to Timothy. And uh, all the church had a responsibility to hear and obey it as well. And so do you and I today. This letter is written to us. And we want to take a special note of the first verse of chapter 4. The doctrines of demons and all of that stuff. Okay, for the next session, I want you to read 2 Timothy, the first two chapters. And with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.